Welcome to the Midlife and Beyond podcast with Joe Blackwell, where we're changing the narrative on ageing one story at a time. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted this week that I've got the lovely Sam Palmer with me again. Um, she's a good friend to the Midlife Movement and we've had her on the Midlife and Beyond podcast before. So thank you for coming back again, Sam. Thank you very much for inviting me, Joe. Well, I want to talk specifically this week about um, the heart and how that is affected by peri and postmenopause and how women experience heart attacks differently to men. So I think it's a really important message to get out there. I've heard you talking about it before. So if you could just start us off by explaining what happens during perimenopause and then into postmenopause with the heart. Yeah, thank you, Joe. You're right. It, it is a really important thing to have some understanding of. I think as as younger women, sort of prior to perimenopause, we, we look at men and perhaps you look at the typical heart attack type of man and you see somebody with a big belly swigging his beer perhaps having a fag and you think you know women don't have heart attacks you know we're, we're really lucky we don't and in fact until the point where our hormones start to fluctuate to a certain extent we are protected from that risk that the person sitting there overweight with a big belly isn't protected because estrogen which is uh, freely produced prior to our perimenopause by our ovaries has a massive effect all over our body as, we, as you probably know and we discussed in all sorts of ways but one of the things that it does is it it protects our cardiovascular system so cardiovascular I'm sure people know cardio to do with your heart vascular to do with your veins your your blood network throughout your body estrogen helps to keep that sort of running smoothly a little bit like the preventing your lime scale in a kettle, if you like, you know, the lime scale build up. So estrogen does that job for us. So even if we're living a life that's really not as healthy as it could be, um, we've got that estrogen on board, which which helps prevent it become a big problem. Now, during the perimenopause, which is the phase which for some people could be seven or 10 years, seven to 10 years, sorry, that's when our estrogen levels aren't at tip top height every month they're starting to go up and down and up and down and up and down and in fact all the symptoms that we notice during our perimenopause are due to these fluctuations in hormones people think that you know one minute you're at level 10 and then a few years later you're at level two you're actually not you go from being full up if you like to a little bit down and then up again and then down a little bit more and up and down a little bit more and that's why sometimes women, you know, one month they feel fine, the next month they think, what the hell is going on? I feel awful because of these fluctuations. But the general trend, Joe, is that the estrogen levels are on a downward trend. And at some point, unless you do something about putting estrogen back in, we have little or, ver or, or no estrogen left at all. Now, that probably isn't going to happen or isn't going to have an effect on our cardiovascular system until we are definitely post-menopause. So let's just for clarification for your listeners, make sure everybody knows we're all on the same hymn sheet. We've got the perimenopause, which I've just explained, where everything's going up and down. And then you've got the menopause and everybody thinks, oh, the menopause, gosh, what's that? It is just one day. It is the day where you haven't had a period for 12 months. So one day you are said to be in menopause, 12 long months without a period. And then from the day after that, you are post-menopause. And that's a whole new phase of our lives, a wonderful phase, but it doesn't mean all those symptoms that you have had suddenly dissipate and they go. It means that some of them may ease off, but you may start to notice new symptoms. And in fact, one of the symptoms that we're talking about today is the fact that the estrogen is that now low, lo no longer there to protect your heart. And that's when your risk of cardiovascular disease, that's heart attacks and strokes, actually starts to go up. And in fact, everybody thinks that breast, that breast cancer is one of the, the biggest killers of women. But heart disease for women in their mid 60s is now one of the top three big killers. So we need as women in that stage of our lives ourselves, aren't we, Joe? We need them. We need to understand that. We need to know what we're thinking about, what we're talking about. 
So I, I, the kettle starts furring up once we've gone past <laughs> post yeah. menopause. Yeah. Um, what, what, what sort of age do we start with the um, gradual decline of oestrogen generally? Because it's before we think of being in perimenopause, isn't it? Well, actually, progesterone and testosterone are the two hormones that start to go down earlier than you think. For some women in their mid to late 30s, and oestrogen doesn't actually start to go down until some time later. But of course, if your progesterone and your testosterone are going up and down, then the balance of all of the hormones is out of whack. So that's why some people have been told that they are oestrogen dominant. It's because everything else has gone down and the oestrogen didn't go down. And then everything else comes up and the oestrogen's still there. So that's why there's this sort of slight muddle, really. Is my oestrogen low? Is my oestrogen high? And of course, that's why we don't recommend that people go and ask for blood tests, because what it might be on Wednesday could be very different on Friday. Of course. And um, um, it's not that oestrogen is, has increased. It's that the others yeah. have gone down. So it's, so it's that balance. That balance, I see. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I've often wondered about that. Yeah. Um, I, I know you've talked before um, about having a heart attack and how women tend to experience it in a different way. So normally um, we think of a heart attack as a sudden clutching of the heart and a, an elephant sitting on your chest and you can't breathe and you collapse to the floor and it's all very dramatic. It's, it's not necessarily that way for us, is it? No, there's a fairly well-known phase, phrase, get my words out, um, that says that women are not small men. Well, well, unlike what manufacturers seem to think, people who test like crash dummies and things like that. Yes, quite. Women are not small men. We are very complicated beings with complicated hormones that don't stay put. They go up and down. So therefore, when we display symptoms of anything, it may not be identical to the symptoms that men display. And a lot of the uh, research that has been done on what a heart attack looks like or feels like has been done in the past on men. And therefore, people are expecting that they're going to look out for the same symptoms. So as you say, typically, if somebody was asked who knows something about it, what do you think of as saying that you might be having a heart attack? It's this crushing chest pain. Sometimes people say it's like having an elastic band around your chest that gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, and the other typical one is this left arm pain. So radiating pain that goes down your left arm. But us women, we may well may well have pain in our jaw. You may well have pain in your upper back. Now, ask me how many women in their mid 60s sometimes have a pain in their back? Well, most of us actually at some yeah. point. So you've got a pain in your jaw, a pain in the back, you may well display signs of breathlessness. But again, you wouldn't necessarily think I'm a bit breathless today. Hmm, that could be something other than the fact that I'm rushing here and rushing there and I'm doing various other things. Another one. And again, who doesn't notice this? Insomnia. Mm. Sleep patterns. Just these are all the early signs that there may be something going on and insomnia. I'm not sleeping very well anxiety and restlessness who isn't anxious well yeah, that's one of the signs of, you yeah. know one of the things that the oestrogen and and, yeah. and everything causes Absolutely. anything isn't it so All to do with our serotonin so anxiety nervousness or restlessness um this is an unusual one but gassiness or bloating all the windy bits coming from places you don't want them to now as our estrogen levels decline, we know that that affects our gut. And that's why women say, I wake up in the morning and my stomach's flat. But by the end of the day, I look like I'm nine months pregnant and we may struggle to eat some food. So we know that gassiness and this sort of bilious feeling is part of it. But also it's one of the precursors, not well known to a cardiac incident and also nausea. Nausea is very definitely one of them. So. I think that this is um, a, a fairly complicated picture. We've got to have the, the signs and symptoms in place and all the risk factors. So if you haven't got any of the risk factors, which we'll discuss in a minute, and you're thinking, well, I've got a sore back and my jaw hurts <laughs> and my stomach's farting and this, and I'm feeling terribly anxious. It doesn't mean you have to rush off down to your 
um, A and E and say, I think I'm having a heart attack because I've listened to Joe's podcast. <laughs> but it, well, yes, it does... and also these symptoms come and go. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if you're having a heart attack, do they come and go or do they stay? And, and just... um, it, it may be that if somebody has got narrowing of their arteries that leads to some of these symptoms and perhaps a little bit more pain and then it disappears. But the reason it's disappeared is because you've stopped lifting heavy boxes, stopped moving all the sofas around in your room. So basically you were doing some kind of exertion mm. and then those symptoms came on and then you stopped the exertion and the symptoms of allayed, that could be indicating some kinds of angina. So angina is when you get the symptoms, but the, the thing that stimulated those symptoms has stopped and they pass off. But it would be definitely, you'd be thinking, okay, I've moved my son into, into university, I've moved his sofa around, I've carried his ironing board and all the boxes up the three flights of stairs to his room, and now I'm feeling breathless, and my jaw's hurting, and my back, and I'm feeling all of these symptoms. But then you sit down on his sofa, and you think, okay, it feels better now. That's an indication that you're not going to move the sofa around. You might go and get checked out at some point in the next few days if you can. But if the symptoms don't go, you are still noticing that sometime after. You might want to get checked out, yeah. Right. So uh, what about pain in the chest? I mean, if you get a sharp pain in your chest, say when you're exercising, yeah. would, it, would that be uh, something to get checked out? Or would that could that be muscular? <laughs> any it? pain I, I think we have to be really careful here any pain that comes on suddenly doesn't go and is perhaps accompanied by other symptoms it would be really wrong of me to say no push on and it's probably muscular <laughs> don't go another test oh, no. you'll be fine so we have to say that yeah. you need to talk to your healthcare professional, whoever that is for you, if you're notice, noticing chest pain, because chest pain needs to be sorted out. It's not always anything to do with your heart. There's all sorts of other things that can give us centralized pain, but we need to rule out <laughs> the risk that it could be something rather than just pretending, oh, Sam said it's probably something to do with my stomach. Oh, gosh, no, I didn't mean to put you on the yeah. spot there. <laughs> no, it's fine, I don't mind, you know, that's, that's why. Um, having a clinical background, having a nursing background means that I am comfortable to talk about this because it's really important that we bring our medical services into this midlife and menopause and postmenopause lifestyle medicine because there are times where we can't sort it out by going for a walk or having a green smoothie. We need people with qualifications on our side to do, you know, to give us a bit more advice and have the checks. I'm just interrupting this podcast to ask you a quick favour. If you're enjoying this conversation, please like, share, subscribe, wherever you're watching or listening. This helps us get seen by more people. Thank you so much. Back to the conversation. So we're saying that um, our symptoms tend to be different, but we don't want to be ignoring symptoms that we would yeah. traditionally associate yeah. with a heart attack because yeah, it absolutely. could present that way as well. Um, I think... At this point, let, let's just let's not be all doom and gloom here. Never, heart attacks have never been more treatable. You know, our, our health care and our doctors are really good at knowing what to do if you get there in time. So there's a statistic that says that if a man thinks that there's something going on with his heart, he will get help within something between sort of a couple of minutes and three hours. He'll think, whoa, I need to go and get this sorted out. And I wonder, Joe, what do you think? How long do you think it takes women? Well, well it can they've take got women. to unstack the dishwasher first, haven't they? And, and just check yeah. that somebody's being picked up. And <laughs> Absolutely. So they quickly make the phone calls, get the children sorted out from school. It can take them up to seven hours. Ooh, because they they're so used to thinking about everybody else like we just put this off okay I will I, I will go and get my heart checked out but I'm just going to do this that and the other so that means that that for for a start they're unaware that their jaw pain or their tummy or this nervousness could be anything other than all of those things so they put it off and think it's something else they're so good at needing to sort everything out they're so needed by so many people that they sort everything out before they get there and then I suppose what we also need to say is the person who receives you at hospital needs to also be aware of these different symptoms. So we are now relying on our medic medical profession to think 
this isn't just a small man and that we're not okay just because she hasn't got this crushing pain or the left arm pain that that she doesn't need sorting out so there is a, a slight risk that you might be given a wrong diagnosis um and and therefore spreading this message is really important absolutely absolutely right okay we're well, talking about some heart attack risk uh, first of all let's let's talk about the sort of i suppose we call them the red flags the things that you would want to avoid and then i'll give you what i see as the best medicine for heart disease prevention or cardiovascular disease prevention because here we're talking about our heart but you know what this thing on the top of our or on top of our bodies our brain you know your vessels your blood vessels are all connected and stroke risk is also something that goes up because the estrogen doesn't just defer the kettle it defers the central heating system or whatever we want to call our brain so yeah. you know, everything that we're doing isn't just protecting our hearts so i think people know by now that smoking is a huge risk so if you are somebody who is smoking trying to reduce your smoking amount prior to stopping is going to make massive difference to you in the long term um weight gain it's it's really difficult to call this because there's a there's a big thing about you know just because i am overweight doesn't mean i am of less value to anybody absolutely but we cannot we cannot avoid the fact that if you are living in a body that is heavier or full of fat it's obese than it needs to be to stay healthy it's a good idea to do something about that so if you have been told by your healthcare professionals that you need to lose a little bit of a weight of weight and and really it's not about the number on the scales it's about waist circumference there's been a big uh, piece of research that says that you know our waist circumference is directly related to our risk of heart disease rather than the number that comes on a box cup on a box you know, if you've got a lot of muscle, if you're a, a heavyweight lifter, um, if you do a lot of exercise, then your weight isn't going to be directly correlating to your health. But being obese, having a lot of fat on board, both visceral and subcutaneous is having a high blood pressure. So lots of people, as they get older, start to notice that their blood pressure goes up. That is also partly due to the changes in our hormones. So being aware, having regular blood pressure checks and knowing that if you've been advised that medication might bring it down, in, a, in addition to changing the way you eat, reducing your smoking, getting more movement into your life, that's also a really important thing. But also related to what you eat is your cholesterol. So high cholesterol rates, um, partly due to what you eat and your stress levels and your sleep and your smoking. So they're all the risks. We know all about these things. So they're the things, the red flags that are going to increase your risk. So again, let's not lead from a place of doom and gloom. Let's lead from the place of, right, what the hell, Sam, can we do about it? I'm going to start something. What am I going to do? Well, my passion is always about movement and exercise. Um, and I talk about the three different types of exercise. And there are two that are particularly important. One is something that raises your heart rate. Now, we are not, I'm not saying anybody's going to go and run a marathon or even 10K or even 5K. If sweeping your garden, if mowing your lawn, if going dancing, anything that raises your heart rate for 20 to 30 minutes a couple of times a week, walking your dog, that's absolutely fine. It doesn't need to be that you've got to embark on some ridiculous endurance exercise. Um, but the other type of exercise is that's really important, and it's not really an exercise, is a restorative movement. So something like yoga, you can hear I've changed my voice, something that calms you down, something that brings down your cortisol levels, which has a knock-on effect on your blood pressure on your cholesterol, on your anxiety. So those are the, the key things there for a good cardiovascular health. Um, food, I'm afraid we can't get away. If it's beige on your plate, it's probably not doing you, other than quinoa, which is quite good. It's not gonna do you any long-term good. So the simple way to think about it is to avoid um, a sort of meat fat, um, not all fat is bad. In fact, fat can be really good, avocados and nuts, but fatty, meaty products um, and processed foods. But if you can think, eat the rainbow, how much colour can I get on my plate? That's a really simplistic way of, of starting it. Um, and 
having lots of protein and lots of variety in your diet. Um, just, to, um, just sorry to stop you in mid flow, but um, eat the rainbow. Yeah. Um, can you explain why that's a good thing? If you eat lots of multicolored foods, you are automatically getting a wide range of nutrients on your plate. So where if you have a yellow carrot and an orange carrot, and I think you can get red carrots, they're probably about 10 pounds per carrot. So don't buy the red carrots. But if you, there, we're not just eating carrot. We've got all the different colorings from the natural colorings of a carrot, and they will all contribute to your gut biodiversity. And having a healthy gut has a knock on effect with your uh, hormones and your health and reducing your menopause symptoms and helping to offset this obesity, reducing your blood pressure. So it's all part of a big puzzle, Joe, that is, is an important thing to think about. Things like broccoli and all the brassicas have been shown to have a really beneficial effects on a midlife woman's health and a nutrient sort of state if you like so it's it, you know we could talk about this for three weeks and we haven't got three weeks we've probably only got about <laughs> one five minutes so i'm not going to go into it but it's a very simple thing the more color you can get on the plate the better that's the easiest way to to, to do it isn't it is to think of it in color so but none of us have got the time to be sort of um you know working it all out it, it yeah. is, you know to give somebody something simple like put as much color on your plate as you can as much variety as you can Absolutely. Yeah. Easier to, to, and then yeah. the next thing would be don't sprinkle too much salt on those colored vegetables. Yeah. So looking at the salt in your diet, the hidden salt in the bread that you buy in the supermarkets, mm -hmm. in the, I don't know, the tinned foods, the baked beans. What can you do to just slowly reduce the salt in your diet? Again, this isn't this. We're not meant to be talking about a nutrition podcast, but it's an awareness, isn't it, Joe? So yeah, we've absolutely. talked about the exercise. We talked about food generally bringing your stress down, but bringing your salt down is, is a whole separate chunk as well as looking to put the good food in. Let's get rid of some of the stuff that's not so healthy. Um, and of course, if you are a smoker, uh, reducing your smoking. Some people ask me, do I have to give up all alcohol? And the answer there is, is no. However, many women find that drinking wine particularly has a really negative effect on their sleep um, and means that they're waking up with hot flushes. So looking at ways that you can reduce your alcohol that feels good for you and potentially rather than having a glass of wine at the weekend, you may find it slightly better to have a gin and tonic. Gin um, and vodka don't seem to have the same effects on our sleep and our hot flushes at night. Why is this important? Because there is a direct correlation with our rest and our sleep, with our blood pressure and how we eat mm -hmm. and obesity. So we can't really take one jigsaw puzzle out of this and say, just concentrate on this. So we start with little tiny changes and over time it makes a big difference. I think awareness as well. I mean, we didn't know a few years ago, really, in the general public that women's heart attack risk increased post-menopause we just didn't know that no. uh, so you know we we might have uh, you know kept an eye on on our partner's plates yeah. uh, said oh, do, you know you're putting too much salt on your plate but we wouldn't think anything of doing on our own yeah. so I think that um, so there's a lot we can do and I think that's the note to end on isn't it that it is there's a lot that we can do to protect our hearts and to protect our risk of stroke um even though we don't have the protection of the oestrogen after yeah. Absolutely. And let's just talk about that very quickly. Um, if HRT is something that people want to take, have been, you know, have been taking for years and there it has no ill effects on their body, then that's fine. But it doesn't mean that all of the risk has gone. So when we were younger, the amount of estrogen that we had in our body was right for us to be a female who might go on and have children, you know, bear children. Our estrogen levels go down, but when you put HRT back in, we don't put them back in as high as they once were. So it doesn't mean you're safe to open a packet of fags and eat and drink and do whatever you want just because you're on <laughs> HRT. Yeah. We, the lifestyle things need to go alongside it. Um, at some point you might want to come off HRT, you might have to come off HRT. So I really believe that the lifestyle medicine is as important, if not more important,
than the HRT, which will definitely bring some benefits and some protection to our midlife hearts. Does the HRT protection for our heart, does that, if we carry on taking it into our 70s, yeah. does it still offer that protection or does the protection level start to decrease? At the moment, it is thought that if you start taking HRT within 10 years of your last period and continue to take it, the cardio protection is thought to be there continuously. Research is changing all the time. Um, there is some research that came out, I think it was last year, that said in the first year of taking HRT, there is a small likelihood of an increase in strokes for some women but that disappears dissipates after a year and most hrt specialists and gps would say that it was a risk um that if that woman is really struggling with her menopause symptoms it would be a risk she, she would be prepared to take because if you're not sleeping you can't get up you can't face the day you can't go to work you can't do any exercise then the negative effects of all of that are hideous so actually, it's much better if HRT is something you want to be on to take the HRT and to get back to a position where you can look after all of those lifestyle things. But I think, um, Joe, we need to be very cautious to say it definitely will or won't do this because how HRT affects every individual woman and the type of HRT they're taking, whether it's via their skin subcutaneously or orally, which most people don't have anymore, will be very different for every woman. So I I don't think we can give blanket assurances. No. So it's all it's all part of the jigsaw of of the care that we need post menopause. And um and it needs to be discussed with your healthcare provider. Yeah, regardless. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well thank you so much for coming in. I'm sure that um you know Pete you'll give give a lot of people food for thought and uh and, and yet another incentive to get ourselves moving and, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and stop drinking too much wine and um and, and eat a little bit better because that's the ultimate in self-care scented candles around the bath we're all very well but if we're yeah. not doing that fundamental self-care that's not really self-care is it no, absolutely. We have to we have to make self time before we can decide on the self care. Unless you've carved out that time, somebody's going to take it and ask you to do something else. Mm -hmm. So find the time to go for the walk, to do all of that stuff. Yeah, it's really important. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you for having me, Joe.